Welcome back, folks. We've been talking about living victoriously in the valleys of life. Randy, you ended the first segment saying you actually anticipate good things when times get tough. Do you mind elaborating on that? Andrew, I've learned and observed that often before something really good happens, there's a spiritual attack. Like the enemy of our souls is trying to do whatever he can to trip us up or tear us down to get us feeling defeated or, or maybe just distracted so that our focus isn't where it needs to be to experience all that God wants for us. It seems like that's just part of spiritual warfare, that it's darkest before the dawn. Mm, I see. I imagine most of our viewers do know that we are in a spiritual battle. Bible verses like your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Or we wrestle not with flesh and blood but with the powers and principalities and forces of wickedness in heavenly places are pretty clear that there is a spiritual battle and we're in the middle of it. That's right. And Jesus said to Peter, Satan has asked that he could sift you like sand. And then there's the story of Job. Satan asked to test Job, to bring troubles and trials like we've never experienced into Job's life. And the Lord allowed it. Psalm 34 says, the righteous man will have many troubles. And we read this Thursday in our online Bible study that Jesus promised we would have trouble in this world. However, he also said we should take courage or be brave because he has overcome the world. That's from John 16. We're going to have troubles. And remembering that can help us get through them with grace, holding on to God's promises all the way through. And in John 16, Jesus also said that the ruler of this world has been defeated. I like that. Greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. So we're in that spiritual warfare, but we're on the winning side. Uh, also, I, I remember a story about a youth group that uh, they'd been trained by their youth pastor to always look for what God was up to when things go wrong. He taught them that when something's going wrong, God is still at work. God's up to something. And you need to look for and expect something good to come out of it. That's what Romans 8.28 means, doesn't it? It's, so basically, he was teaching them to trust that God was working for their good, even though it may seem like everything else is going wrong. Right. It may seem like your world is coming apart at the seams, but God is up to something. When things are going badly or going wrong, I shouldn't get mad at God. I should ask questions like, Lord, what do you want me to learn in this time? How do you want me to grow through this? What are your purposes? How can I bring glory to you in the middle of this trial? Wow, that demonstrates a very different attitude than most of us have when things are going off script or they're deviating from our preferred plans or paths. So is there more to your story? Well, sure, that youth pastor ended up taking this youth group on a mission trip to Africa. At one point they were traveling by bus and they're going to stay overnight at a compound far away. When they got about halfway there, they got a flat tire which couldn't be fixed till morning. And so they had to make alternate arrangements and stay at a different location. The group, rather than being frustrated or irritated, embraced this turn of events as God's plan since there was nothing they could do about it. Wow, didn't they wonder why it happened and, and weren't they a bit upset or angry that their plans didn't work out like they wanted? Well, they did wonder, but in a positive way, they had an anticipation that God was doing something good. And so they didn't fall into that negativity. Hmm. So did they ever find out? Often, I don't find out until much later. Me too. Sometimes it can be years before we are able to look back and see what God was up to. But in their case, they could find out pretty quickly. Uh, the next day, they were able to get the tire fixed and continue on their way. And when they reached their desti destination, they discovered that lions had entered the compound where they would have been sleeping and had actually mauled someone. If they had been there, they would have all been in grave danger. Wow, talk about a flat tire being a blessing. That's a great example. So when things don't work out the way we plan, we should remember that God is up to something. Andrea, I was reading an article that uh, recently said, well, it, it asked a question. It said, what Bible character, let's see if you can get this at home, uh, was raised in a dysfunctional family, okay. removed from his or her own culture, and ended up having to work a dead-end job? That gives a triple hit to your self-esteem or identity and a triple challenge to your faith development, wouldn't you think? Yeah, well, um, I can think of several who had at least two of the three. Uh, David, who was in our story time today. Uh, then you've got Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. 
uh, Joseph, uh, Naaman's servant girl, and Jesus himself. A lot of God's people have had to endure or overcome significant challenges before experiencing the blessings he had in store for them. So true. Uh, that's the point. We often get upset when God asks us to go through tough times. But when you just look at the lives of all these people from the Bible, you realize it's just part of living in this world. David was stuck at the bottom of the sibling lineup, overlooked when Samuel came calling. He was left out in the field watching sheep like we saw in the story earlier. He had little chance of advancement giving all the people in line in front of him. Then he was torn from his family to live near the palace so he could be called on to play soothing music when an evil spirit came to torment the king. Later on he had to flee for his life from his jealous father-in-law and eventually flee the country and fake insanity to avoid execution while living among his enemies. In spite of all of that, he hung on to his faith. He lived victoriously. And Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were youths in Israel during a time of war and subjugation. They were ripped from their families and they were taken as captives to a foreign land where they had to learn a new language and they had to go on a vegetarian diet. That alone would have killed me. I'd prefer to be a meditarian. Me too. Two <laughs> meditarians. They were also threatened with death on multiple occasions mm. when the king asked for the impossible. They too are shining examples of people who held on to their faith and trust in God's love and goodness in spite of their problems. Now we don't want to get the wrong idea, kids. You need to eat your vegetables. Uh, but there's also Joseph's family. It was a total mess. His brothers betrayed him, selling him to slave traders. He was falsely accused while working as a slave and then thrown in prison. And he was forgotten while in prison by those who said they'd help get him out of prison. Just left there to rot. All of them had every reason to doubt God, to be angry about their circumstances or situation to jettison faith and forget about God because it sure seemed like he didn't care about them. But none of them did. They all continued to trust in God even when their lives were on the line. All of them ended up with positions of power, influence, authority, and in or near the palace or the nobility. Yeah, God had fantastic plans for all of their lives. But you know, not all of us is gonna end up as a noble or a prince or a king. I thought of somebody else whose tale was somewhat different, ended up in more of a dead-end job. Do you remember Naaman's servant girl? Yeah, I do. Uh, like some of the others, she was ripped away from her family. But we don't know what happened to her family. It's likely they had been killed in a raid which, and where she was taken. Yeah, the Bible doesn't tell us what happened to her family, but it doesn't even tell us her name. She never ended up with power or authority or riches of any kind. Talk about a dead-end job. She was a servant girl or a slave all of her life to Naaman and his wife in this foreign land. But she didn't hold a grudge or respond to her circumstances with bitterness. Rather than seeking vengeance, she shared faith and sought the betterment of those around her, even though we know that she didn't benefit from it personally in this life. We do know she spoke up about God. She made a difference in the lives of those around her. Because of her attitude and her words and actions, she had a great impact. I can't help but wonder if we would be able to show such faith and trust and grace if we were in the same situation. Or what about our present situation? Folks, you and I need to rest and rely on the love God has for us, no matter what we're going through. And if we do, the small stuff won't set us off as easily, and the big stuff, it will push us closer to Him. What a great mindset or frame of mind the love of God, resting and relying, knowing and relying on the love God has for us. If that were a picture frame and you put what's going on in your life in that picture frame, you might see it a little differently. If we use that as a filter to measure and judge and interpret all that goes on in our lives, in our world, in our life, would come through much better in the end. We know and rely on the love God has for us. That one verse from 1 John 4, 6 can help us get through anything victoriously. Amen. Don't lose heart, folks. Don't cave into pressure or give into the temptation not to trust. Join us. Become somebody who rests and relies on the love that God has for you. Hey, let's pray together. <coughs> Father, thank you for your love. Let me encourage people to rest and rely on the love that you have for them. Lord, we look at the cross and your great love. Look at you sending Jesus to be our Savior. Look at you laying down your life for your, for your friends and dying for us while we were still sinners. Jesus, your love for us is 
unconditional and unfathomable. Holy Spirit, make that love real to everyone that's watching this today, I pray. And, and through that, build our hope. Help us to be able to hold on no matter what's going on around us. And Lord, there's a lot of people that are just that have been battered by the winds and storms of life. Pray for the people in Fort McMurray. Pray for the people affected in Nova Scotia by what happened there. Lord, we pray for the families of those who were, who were lost when the helicopter went down and, and all their comrades on the ship. Lord, draw people closer to yourself, even in these times of darkness or despair or death, through the grief, Lord, that people are experiencing, losing loved ones to COVID-19. Draw them to yourself. Comfort them. Strengthen them. Help them to rethink their ideas about you and about eternity, Lord, and, and make their peace with you if they've been separated or living in disbelief. Lord, lead them to a place to trust their life, their present, and their eternity in your hands. Amen. Lord, help us to love you more and live in your love. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We encourage you to join with us in worship as we worship through the, the last few songs in our playlist. If you have any questions or you want to contact us, you can find all that information at roseville.ub.ca. That's roseville.ub.ca. Have a great day. God bless. <laughs>